some visuals. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's see if we can get it bigger than this one here. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, this is some of our gang, but we had folks come from India, from Japan, from Honduras, from all over the world, and they all brought their projects with them to tell us about their projects. Yeah. It was so amazing and energizing. And it was decided we were going to write an accord, a youth accord. And we were going to get uh, as many of our youth as we could to Nagoya, Japan next month for the meeting of the parties to present this youth accord in biodiversity. We have 25 languages now that we've translated this wow. youth accord in. And uh, as we move towards 5,000 signatures from 74 countries, uh, we keep building on that. And our organization, we set up a not-for-profit organization called Biodiversity Matters. And uh, we're sending eight young people to Nagoya and two chaperones next month to present this youth accord. And basically, it was written by them, by youth from all over the world. And we've now made networks with Indonesia, with Spain, and now we keep building these networks. But it's, it's a network that's really just sharing what everybody else is doing, so we know we're not alone. It was amazing going to a major paper in Ottawa and asking a newspaper if they would like to feature some of the work that these youth are doing. And I was told by a reporter that it's really not very interesting for our readers to find out what youth are doing with the environment. <laughs> this was by a major reporter of a major paper in Ottawa. So anyway, we are getting interest, and we're getting a lot of interest. And now we've made partners. Actually, if we could go back to the, the main page again. Okay. If we go back, back home. home. Okay. And if you go down, scroll down to the bottom, you'll see that we have quite a few farther down. Please. Oh, OK. We've made quite a few partners. Uh, uh, Jane Goodall herself we presented to the Accord to. Um, we're working as well. David Suzuki knows about us and, and our friends um, with uh, Robert Bateman and of course some like Durrell, which is an incredible zoo in the UK. They're helping us set up a blog, an international blog of youth and biodiversity talking about conservation efforts. It's all connected to our website. And um, we'll actually go back up to the top and we'll click on the red bar that says blog. Okay. And here's an opportunity. Oh, just down a little bit. Oh, I Here's see. our blog. And we just started it last month, but we're getting uh, entries from all over the place. And Duro is, is uh, helping us, uh, you know, highlight various species. And then, who is, and who is this person? <laughs> so we have our youth leader series. Jess is going to uh, COP10 next month in Japan. And this is an opportunity for them to express and talk about their excitement about the projects they're doing from around the world. So without further ado, I've done enough talking about the history of my uh, project that's now become their project. And uh, Jess, would you like to talk about some of your favorite nature experiences? Uh, definitely some of the things that I will remember for about most of my life is going from, now I'm in my fifth different school. I started off um, at one school where it was a playground as shown in pictures which is cement. Cement and a metal play structure which maybe 20 kids were allowed on it because people would fall off and break their bones. <laughs> so you're pretty much sitting on the pavement doing nothing for your 20 minutes of recess. Then going to Sailor Mount Academy and for science class getting told bring rubber boots or bring stuff you don't care to get dirty. I live in the city. My house is three feet away from the next house and my neighbor is right behind and I can see right into their back window. <laughs> I don't want to go and put my hands in mud. I got told okay now lift up this rock you might find something cool. I don't want to lift off that rock. It's <laughs> disgusting. Well, why would I want to see what's underneath? <laughs> lift it up, and there's a salamander underneath. Coolest thing ever. Pick it up in your hands, hold it for a while, go under other rocks. By one time, I had 10 salamanders in my hand. Mm -hmm. So excited to see them. And then being able to go in the winter and drill through the ice, seeing that there's still life living under there. When I was in grade five, I thought everything in the water froze. Nothing would live when figuring out everything does and going into my high school now, now I'm back to desk work 
opening up a textbook and reading about things that I got to experience in the marsh, being able to see, I can be like, oh yeah, I saw that 3D when you guys are looking at it 2D. <laughs> so those are just some of my experiences. Um, well, actually, the first time, because uh, I live in Chelsea, Quebec, it was close to Gatineau Park, but I really hadn't had a real appreciation. I really hadn't had a real appreciation for what was around me. I really didn't, just really didn't pay attention. And when I went to the marsh the first day, right, I went there. I um, I kind of wandered away from the rest of the class. And I turned around. I saw this nice, this nice cardinal, right, right there. And I leaned in. When I went in, I, it, just, it almost like it exploded. All these birds just shot right out of the trees. Like, Whoa! <laughs> and it was just, it was amazing. Right? And ever since that, I've just noticed so many more things just in my backyard and just about anywhere I go. And I have just so much, so much more uh, my appreciation for everything. And I go outside more because I know that I'll probably find something that's pretty cool. And Keegan was saying at lunch that his friends were kind of amazed when he would be out with them and he would point to something and say, oh, and this is a you know, whatever, whatever, and name the species and, and have that connection. And then I said to him, yeah, and you know, you probably could have told them it was anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't have known the difference. But that getting to know the naming of your world, making it a place that is your own. We talk about belonging. That's what I hear when I hear these, these two incredible youth words about nature, creating a sense of belonging. I, I just wanted to say that I, I think that the average young person can probably name two or three hundred uh, logos from various companies, uh, whether it be uh, IKEA or uh, some some fancy designer shoe. But um, when it comes to actually naming things in your own backyard, I mean, how many people know a house finch from a purple purple finch or like these? beautiful animals. We live in an area of the world that's rich, rich, rich with diversity and color and musical sounds from the birds and, and all of these strange and bizarre creatures. And A friend of mine from Agriculture Canada told me once that of the 30,000 species of insects that are found in a 30 kilometer radius around Parliament Hill, he estimates that, that half of them have been identified by science. That's Henri Goulet. He's a, a beetle expert. But he, he says that there's so much we haven't discovered yet. And I'm sure of those 1,300 species that the kids have, have come across and we've documented. And, and one of the things, and Keegan, if you could hold up that journal, the, the thing that we do in our school basically is we uh, learn journaling. Nature journaling, just like the the great explorers like Darwin or Henry uh, Thurlow or, or some of uh, there was another gentleman there from uh, way back in the 1700s, Gilbert White. These people wrote journals. They wrote letters. They they wrote letters to naturalists. They tried to learn about their their environments. And when the kids start journaling and, and making diaries of their experiences, basically they can do it through art photography, whatever makes them feel good. And when Jessica was in grade six, uh, actually we got a, an opportunity for her to show her nature photography from the McCann Marsh at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa. So she got to do a display of some of her photography. What a great thing for a grade six student. But it, it's just that idea that it's your own and you can make it your own and it's your, your experiences. And in 20, 30, 40, 50, years down the line you can pick up that book and, and have all those memories and it's a wonderful memory to have. And, uh, I'd like to, to pick up on something you said there Mike about the, the naming of the logos versus the naming of the native species. The Biodome here in Montreal has a new initiative called La Somme de Dix, I think it is and what it is is it's challenging young people and school teachers as well, to be able to go outside and name 10 birds, name 10 trees, find 10 different kinds of rocks, 10 different kinds of invertebrates, 
and build that understanding and that sense of belonging and that sense of love. We also have with us uh, in, in our audience today, Keegan's mom, and she shared a very wonderful observation that when Keegan started exploring the natural world in his science class, thanks to this wonderful teacher, his, his comportement, his behavior actually changed. There was a palpable difference. I'm sorry, Keegan. <laughs> that, that Keegan was calmer and more, uh, more conscious and aware and awake around you know, the, the people and the living things around him. And that's huge. What, we're, what we keep hearing over and over again is that people become present. They become present and wakeful. When you think of all that higher thinking that we've been doing all day today, and you guys did all day yesterday, looking at ecosystem services and that whole framework, if you don't have a wakefulness <laughs> in your decision making, if you don't keep nature as part of the lens uh, that, that is always there, like the blood running through your veins and the water running through our waterways, your decisions are not going to be wakeful and they are not going to be informed and we are going to find ourselves in these situations that we find ourselves in so often today. I wanted to draw your attention to a few things. The Child and Nature Alliance put together a declaration and uh, it was the Declaration for Children, Families and Nature and this was back last year in March. And it was uh, who's really the, who, are, who, who is the Children the, Nature the, Alliance? The Child Nature Alliance came out of, in fact, the American version of the Children's Nature Alliance, which came out of the movement "Last Child in the Woods" from Richard Liu's book uh, that we discussed earlier. And so the the Child Nature Alliance um, is a national organization, and you can check out their website. And I'm not sure if I have the website here. No, but if you just Google, oh yes, it's just www.childnature.ca. And what I can do is I will send um, my slides, which you didn't see all of, and with the the links, and then that will be available to you. The California Roundtable on Recreation, Parks and Tourism has recently put out 10 things that it includes in something called the Outdoor Bill of Rights. So it's the California Children's Outdoor Bill of Rights. Just to share with you a few things. So a child by age 14 should have discovered something about California's past should have splashed in the water, played in a safe place, camped under the stars, explored nature, learned to swim, played on a team, followed a trail, caught a fish, and celebrated their heritage. And this is actually presented as a Bill of Rights. Here in Quebec last Thursday in Montreal at uh, Mont Royal, a lot of the thinkers and the movers in policy work, in education work, came together around the table to look at la connexion enfant-nature and the disconnect between children and nature. And we are putting together a declaration that we will launch at our CADOC, at our conference in November that's advertised outside. There is momentum. There is movement forward. Do I want another study? that shows that children have stress reduction when they go outside once a week for 22 minutes. No, nope, I don't want to see any more research like that. I don't want people to ask me if they could use a high school class that I work with to take the hyperactive kids out once a week to a park and see if their attention increases. We have the evidence. We know the impact that nature had on us growing up we can understand the impact that it has on young people today and we have two stellar examples with us today. The time for that kind of medicalized <laughs> academic research, as far as I'm concerned, is over. It's time for action. We need to just move forward with this and then perhaps it would be interesting to do some research on what happened. The explosion of creative thinking of multi-layered problem solving that comes from free exploration in the natural world with other like-minded young people.